So you were looking at the remains or the specimen from a place in Persepolis, so that would be in Iran, and then you use that to trace it back all the way to Afghanistan. Yes. Wow. <laughs> How do you do that? Welcome to the Knowledge Archives podcast. We're a group of students on a mission to learn from as many different disciplines of knowledge as possible. I'm your host, Madhav Malhotra, and today I'm glad to be joined by Dr. Ryan King, a visiting assistant professor at the New York University in the U.S. His work focuses on the history of Middle Eastern civilizations, specifically focusing on the Achaemenid Empire. Today, I'm excited to learn more about the specifics of how he uses archaeological evidence to learn more about this history. All right. So thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. I'm very excited to hear about this area. I literally have not heard about it anywhere else except for your one research paper that I read. And I know that it will be a lot of, you know, learning about very specific things afterwards. But at the beginning, I'd like to hear a little bit about yourself in general, maybe what you are focusing on in your PhD, and how you got involved in this area of research. Sure. Um, happy to be here. First of all, my name is Ryan King. I actually just defended my PhD dissertation last week successfully. So I, ha I now have a doctorate, I guess. At the University of Chicago, I am in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. At a lot of other universities, this might be called Middle Eastern Studies. So essentially, my department is if you study the area of the world between more or less Egypt and Afghanistan, Egypt and Turkey and Afghanistan, uh, you would be in my department. And that includes everything from prehistory to, you know, today. So it's a, a diverse group of scholars in my department. Specifically, I study the history of the Achaemenid Empire, I guess more commonly called the Persian Empire. So I'll give some background about this. The Achaemenid Empire began in around 550 BCE, and over about a 50-year period, several kings conquered the area of what is now Egypt and Turkey roughly stretching east to uh, Pakistan. And this empire lasted for about 220 years um, until Alexander the Great conquered the Persian Empire, the Achaemenid Empire. The reason I use the term Achaemenid Empire is because there are a number of empires throughout history that people have called the Persian Empire. And it's just to uh, make things more specific. If you want to call it the Persian Empire, you're not wrong. I will try to pronounce that right for the rest of the episode, and that is a big empire, like geographically thinking. From, yes, it's huge. Yeah, wow, that's a big empire. And I know that um, for your specific research paper, you were looking at the system of taxation and finances in the empire specifically. Could you tell us yeah. more about that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So the Achaemenid Empire is very peculiar in its economic system because essentially half of the empire uses what we would now call money in the form of coinage. And that would be the Western half, the regions which now border on the Mediterranean Sea. Whereas the Eastern half doesn't use money nearly as much. In a lot of this region, you have the use of weighed silver coinage, or not coinage, but silver bullion, just hunks of silver that would, people would weigh and then, you know, X amount of silver would be worth X amount of grain, let's say. This is more cumbersome though than coinage, which is easier to handle and worth a standardized amount. Uh, but what's important to note here is that coinage only is invented about a hundred years before the Achaemenid Empire in what is now Turkey. And over the next in the intervening 100 or so years b between the invention of coinage and the coming of the Achaemenid Empire, coinage spreads a bit. So it's pretty widely used throughout what is now Western Turkey and then across the Greek city-states, which are contemporaneous with the 
Persian Empire, places like Athens and Sparta that most people at least have some passing familiarity with. So there's a big question here of how do you essentially deal with an economy that in which part of it is monetized and the other part is not monetized. So my research paper was about a region of the Achaemenid Empire in what is now southern Afghanistan called Arachosia. And this region is centered on what is now the city of Kandahar in Afghanistan, which existed in ancient times as well. So we have ancient texts about Kandahar, a very old city in this region. What I demonstrated in my paper was we have uh, a series of stone objects, mostly mortar, mortars, excuse me, and pestles. So what you use for grinding spices today, but these are much bigger, not really practical, uh, and plates and trays, things like this, essentially really fancy tableware, more or less, made out of precious stone. And there are, there's Aramaic writing on this. So Aramaic is a language closely related to Hebrew or Arabic. It's in that language family, what we call Semitic languages. And I showed that this writing on these documents uh, demonstrates that these vessels of tableware were essentially collected taxation that was produced in Aracosia and then transported over a thousand kilometers into the city of Persepolis in what is now southwestern Iran, which is one of the royal centers of the Achaemenid Empire. Hmm. So you were looking at the remains or the specimen from a place in Persepolis, so that would be in Iran, and then you use that to trace it back all the way to Afghanistan. Yes. Wow. <laughs> How do you do that? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. The answer is that there are occasionally on some of these documents, places mentioned. The main one is Aracosia, the ancient word for Aracosia. There are others, there's some other names that are places, frankly, most people didn't know of before these documents existed. But to explain more about this, I should probably explain more about Persepolis, if that's all right. So Persepolis was a new foundation by one of the early Achaemenid kings named Darius. The Oriental Institute, which is a research institute at my university, the University of Chicago, excavated the remains of Persepolis in the 1930s. And this was a joint cooperation between the University of Chicago and uh, archaeological authorities in Iran. So a lot of these archaeological objects, especially small finds like these bowls, were brought back to Chicago for further study, and then some may remained in Iran. What was found at the, at the remains of Persepolis, uh, of course, lots and lots of items, but what's important for us here is that there were thousands of clay tablets um, with cuneiform writing on them. Uh, cuneiform is this old system of writing originally invented in what is now Iraq, uh, where you imprint a wedge-shaped uh, reed into wet clay, which makes what looks completely unreadable, looks like a bunch of triangles and chicken scratch, but people can read it, luckily. <laughs> these, these clay tablets from Persepolis were written in, a, in an ancient language called Elamite, which is not related to any modern language, so that makes it harder to decipher, but we have a good idea about most of what this says at this point. This has seen academic study for over 100 years. This archive is much, much larger than the text I was writing about in this research. Um, and it essentially records what authorities in Persepolis are doing with food. It's really, it's really mundane on a sort of basic level. They're like receipts, more or less. But when you read 2,000 of them, you have a really good idea of how the empire works. And it's from these texts that we can see travelers from across the empire coming into Persepolis. And from these texts, we have uh, a lot of ancient place names that we're now able to place in specific regions. So from these cuneiform texts, we have a bunch of place names that we can place in Aracosia, which is the region these, these stone tableware um, materials 
come from. So because we have this information in a separate group of texts from Persepolis, scholars can tell about other groups of texts, such as these tableware, even though they're strictly speaking separate types of documents, but they give similar sorts of information. Mm -hmm. So is it that like there are the logic collection from excavating Persepolis, some of the documents are related to taxation, they might just be receipts, as you call them, but then other, you know, remains might just be the tableware, the motels and pistols that you were talking about, like they're different? Yes, um, they are different. So Persepolis is a huge complex. There are a number of palaces there. The Achaemenid kings were essentially the richest, not essentially, they were the richest people in the world at this time. So they had, you know, half a dozen, 10, a dozen palaces just for the royal family to use when they were there. Within Persepolis, these cuneiform documents come from a separate location than this tableware. Uh, so the tableware comes from a building, really a palace, called the Treasury by the Excavators, where there was found these, this tableware, but also a lot of other uh, you know, really luxurious things. Whereas these cuneiform tablets were actually found inside of a wall, a wall system. And the cuneiform tablets were dumped there because they weren't of any use to anyone anymore. They recorded business that was no longer useful to the administrators. Also at the treasury building are a separate group of tablets which record uh, transactions regarding silver. The other tablets, which is the greater group called the fortification tablets, these just record food. Um, so this is the really mundane stuff. So in this huge location of Persepolis, we have several different groups of texts which tell us about several different things. It's always important to ask yourselves why these ancient texts were written, right? When it's something like a story, uh, there's a number of answers you could say, why was a story written? When it's something like an accounting text, it's usually very boring. It's just, it's usually because someone needed to account for how much food was in a storehouse or things like that, how much silver is in this room. So usually these texts um, that I'm studying in this article tell us very specific things about concerns that really only matter to a handful of administrators of, of any given place. And in this case, it was about the records of taxation in one part of the empire over a certain period of time. Yeah. And one thing that I found interesting in your research paper was actually talking about how these texts had to be understood over time. I know you briefly mentioned that we've had them for a very, very long time now, and many researchers have gotten their hands on them, but I found it really interesting how you talked about how this one researcher, Bowman, that first discovered this text, he may have played a very, let's say, large role in interpreting it a certain way and writing a book about it that maybe was critiqued over time. Could you tell us that story and what the controversy was around understanding these archaeological documents? Yes, absolutely. So Raymond Bowman uh, was a professor at the University of Chicago, where I am many years ago. I, I think he passed away like 30 years ago. So I never met him or had the opportunity to meet him. He was a specialist in Aramaic language. So he took it upon himself to publish these documents from Persepolis. And he interpreted them as essentially records of a ritual, a religious ritual. The reasons for this are uh, complicated, but the main reason is that a lot of ancient Iranian studies, of which Achaemenid history is a part, has had for a long time been mostly focused on the history of religion, religions, particularly uh, what we would call Zoroastrianism, which is a religion still practiced today, but only by a few hundred thousand people, especially in Iran. And uh, there's a larger community actually in Mumbai these days. But it was it was the dominant religion of the Iranian world until uh, Islam became more popular. 
And so Bowman, like many scholars of ancient Iran, wanted to see Zoroastrianism in all aspects of ancient Iranian life, which is understandable. Religion is important to all societies at any given time. But frankly, these documents don't have anything to do with religion. Um, and all the reviewers of this book pointed out that this religion thesis is not correct. And pretty much all of them reached, all of the reviewers of the book reached a consensus that they were more or less accounting texts of some sort. So my contribution was to more specifically demonstrate that they were records of taxation by people in Aracosia to Persepolis. But I was building upon certainly decades of earlier work that dealt with Bowman's work um, and some later commentary, commentators. Mm -hmm. I noticed in your paper that like, you were doing a lot of very, very specific line-by-line -line analysis of these texts. And even like at times citing, okay, this group of researchers says this one word means X, and then another group says it means Y, and then trying to figure out like which one is it. But I imagine like if you have thousands of documents, you can't do that for all of them. So is it usually the case that people will actually go line by line, document by document, and have many sets of eyes look things over, or is that a rare exception it's not rare but it's not common somewhere in between i guess i would say with these ancient documents uh it's really necessary to do the work that bowman originally did where you have to read these things carefully and oftentimes you're not a, you're not 100 percent sure what something says and then people will offer their best interpretations but it's important to get something into writing so that you know the larger body of scholars can improve upon these things. And so even if my article is critical of Bowman's interpretation, I'm very appreciative that he initially published these things because for, for every ancient document that someone's published, there's another, you know, 10 or so sitting in museums that no one's actually read yet, particularly with these cuneiform documents. And then the question about the sort of line by line reading. Yeah, a lot of these corrections happen just someone reading one text and is able to improve the reading of one word. And this stuff is important because, you know, by making a hundred small corrections, we can get to a, a bigger contribution, a bigger idea. At the same time, there's a lot of people, and I myself am more in this sort of mode of analysis that tries to read a hundred or a thousand of these documents to draw larger patterns from them. And my paper wouldn't have been possible if I were focused on one or two texts. I had to reread all of them, but sort of at a bird's eye view, bird's eye view to get to um, what I think the entire group of texts is saying as a whole. So would it be like a, an archaeologist might take on a specialized role to say, okay, now uh, I will peer review this one specific document, but most of the time you have other research where you're corroborating all sorts of different sources. Yeah, it, it, it's it's certainly like that. There's room for both this sort of micro analysis and more macro analysis. And of course, even what I'm doing as a sort of macro level is not very macro at all, right? But uh, eventually someone can take what my paper says in combination with a dozen other papers about specific regions and build together a greater analysis of accumulated taxation, which can then become a greater, a part of a, a larger analysis about how taxation works in ancient Eurasia or something. Yeah, well, that's really cool because you have to assume like how many people put in efforts at every individual level, actually starting at the individual excavators to then people reviewing what has been found to then people building on top, like so many levels, and it's like at any one node in that in that network, it's very important to think about, you know, are people following the right processes, and think about how individuals like Bowman they might all have certain biases that do affect how they build up this knowledge. So, I was very curious to ask you about this kind of idea of preventing bias and of reinterpreting evidence. And 
the first thing that I was curious about is whether, like, are there standard ways for people to get access to this kind of evidence so that you can critique it or reinterpret it? Uh, yes. So this is an important question and really a, a debated one, much debated across academia right now. I will say I think huma the humanities in a broad sense is much better about sort of open access publishing than the hard sciences are, which are often restricted be behind very expensive journal licenses. Uh, so Bowman's book, for example, and actually all the excavation records from the University of Chicago's excavation at Persepolis are freely available online to download via the, a University of Chicago website. So this is really important. The number one thing for preventing biases and for encouraging transparency is making sure as much of the material is available for free as possible. So I will say in the, the case of the Persepolis material, we're doing pretty well. So that's an important step. But one of the important other steps is peer review. And so my particular article was read by two anonymous reviewers who gave me comments and feedback and then said, you can publish it. And this is, this is important, <laughs> of course. You want to make sure that other experts in the field free from personal obligations. So that's why the blind, double blind aspect of peer review is important. Say that individual works are of high enough quality to be published. But that of course doesn't mean they're without necessarily without any fault, but they're at least of a certain level where they're valuable to put out to a general public. And then how do you, besides this, how do you reduce uh, your own biases? I will freely admit it's not possible to completely eliminate one's biases. And therefore, I think it's just important to present your work at public venues, get feedback from other people, and frankly, just read pretty widely uh, across disciplines to make sure there's no sort of blind spot in your own approach. There's no real, I don't have a great secret here, but it's just do as much as you can to reduce your own biases. Yeah, if you could uh, give an example of some recent time where you learned something from being able to share your work with someone else and then you realize, wait, oh, maybe like, the topic I'm thinking about, maybe it's not exactly as I thought. Do you have any memories of that happening recently? So admittedly, I have not had as much opportunity to present during the pandemic, uh, but early during the pandemic, I think about a year ago, I, I gave a paper that was originally supposed to be in person at a conference of ancient historians in a broader sense. So this was mostly people that study ancient Greece and Rome, actually. I was presenting on the Persian Empire, as you might expect. But I, I gave a paper that used some the quantitative material that has become increasingly used, ancient studies, which is social network analysis. You used some of this language earlier with the nodes and the networks. And I was presenting some, uh, some work on cuneiform documents from what is now Iraq in the Persian period, trying to argue that we can use some of these tools of analysis to specify how Persian imperial authorities cooperated with essentially local elites from a specific city in Mesopotamia. And this is a field I'm very much sort of dipping my toes into the quantitative material. So presenting at this conference for a much broader audience gave me access to people who knew some of the more theoretical quantitative material better than I did, but didn't know the specific historical documents as, as well as I did. So by collaborating with this material, I think in the end, I will have a much better paper. It's in the review process now. So that's one instance of where it, it helped me, who was a specialist in a particular region, gain access to people who knew more about a particular methodology than I did. Yeah, we've actually talked to guests in the past who were talking about the important applications of network analysis, whether it be in just business or whether it be in theoretical mathematics, actually. So it's really cool to hear about another application here in archaeology. And the last question I actually had for you today was regarding the future of this field. 
and especially which open questions or future research areas you see being prioritized more regarding this history of the Persian Empire? Yeah, um, my main interest is essentially in how do phenomena, whatever that may be, taxation, gender relations, slavery, and lots of things I'm interested in, but how do phenomena which are particular to one region, let's say Ericosia, or let's say what is now Turkey, how is what is happening in Turkey relate to what is happening in Egypt versus Iraq? So most of my research is comparative across different regions. And so my dissertation, for example, was about government on a regional level, but comparatively across the empire. I'm excited about this because a lot of Achaemenid history has been really rigorous studies of local history. But I think a way forward would be to compare a lot of these patterns across the empire. This is essentially what makes it an empire, right? It has to work coherently across a very large space. So that's the broad, the very broad strokes of my research. Yeah, I love that. It's again, referring back to that idea of how you're just always grouping levels of knowledge together and then building on top of that. And I think in general, on a philosophical note, that is the thing that allows us to advance as our species with all of the tools that we have. So I think it is a great note to wrap up on in terms of a general finish. But thank you so much for diving us through, you know, from what this empire, an unpronounceable empire actually is, all the way to like how you're thinking about what future themes of work you might be involved in later. You're very welcome. It was very nice to talk to you as well. <laughs>